we were in COVID, we did that and we put them on our YouTube channel so you guys can watch it again. Um, listen again, you're not gonna watch anything. This will just be an audio one. And I will try my hardest to get that up sometime today or, or tomorrow um, when I get home. All right, so publishing models is today's talk. Um, specifically, this is the art and craft of your, your author business. Now, I know a lot of us um, maybe are just starting out. Some of us have an entire catalog of books. So we're at different portion points of our you know, authorpreneurship, um, if you wanna call it that. Some of us are, are doing you know, artwork. Some of us are doing poems. Some of us are writing books. Some of us are doing podcasts. We are kind of like spreading the gambit, but it all kind of applies. We're just talking general <laughs> business practices that we as authors have, whether you're working with a small press, you still have to build your, your reputation out, treat yourself like a publisher, whether we're doing uh, self-published or traditionally published models or methods, um, these apply. And so we're gonna talk about what the publishing models look like, how does that differ from business models, and then your everyday day-to-day -day marketing activities and how they kind of funnel into those. So it's, it's a nice, for some of you guys are fairly new to kind of get like a, a 10,000 foot meta view so you guys can have a nice focus as you begin to think about yourself as an author, not just as someone who writes books, but somebody who markets and sells themselves and their brand. Very important to do that. So today's talk was an inspiration out of a podcast I listened to. Um, this is a really good podcast. If you guys aren't listening to it, I, I would highly suggest you to, to join this one. This is a self-publishing advice podcast. And I believe it's... Um, a podcast that collects other podcasts from this group and kind of pushes them out. They put about one or two a week. They're always very good, 20 to 40 minutes long, very enjoyable, talking about craft, the art of publishing, um, writing, writing to market, marketing yourself, all the ins and outs of independent publishing. Very, very enjoyable. This was the episode that I, I, I listened to and I said, hey, this is kind of a, a new way of looking at a, an old concept. I enjoyed it, so I would highly recommend you listening to this. This is Orna Ross, the, the, the hostess, um, Howard Lovey. Um, very good, very enjoyable, short, short little talk. Orna Ross tends to be, she has her own podcast, I think, with Joanna Penn. Uh, she's a very famous uh, author's author. Um, and they talk a lot about you know, self-publishing concepts, ideas, a lot of the challenges, how you guys can overcome those things. So I'd, I'd, I'd uh, suggest you do that. They're also part of the Alliance of Independent Authors group. They have books and podcasts and blog info, another good place to, um, to, to get in that. So today's talk is a distillation of kind of what that podcast is about, but I would still recommend you to go to listen to it. All right, so the first thing that we always have to overcome when we are authors, business people, is the time that we have. So we have about 168 hours a week, 5,000 in a month. It can be taken up by a lot of different things, life, family, children, uh, writing or marketing or our day jobs to help pay the mortgage and everything. So we have a lot of responsibilities. And for us, because we live in a finite world with a finite amount of time, requires us to economize and economize our choices. So it is very damaging to us to spend a lot of time doing stuff that is wasteful and not making the right decisions. And so thinking about what we're gonna talk about today, I wanna try to give you guys a framework on approaching yourself as an author so that you have a system in place to make good decisions, to also know when you're making bad decisions. And these are not concepts that are unique to authors. These are businesses and corporations and my life in corporate America was very much aligned to this level of thinking. Um, and I wanna just make sure that we understand that you know, even though we're authors and we're creatives and we have you know certain left or right brain, whatever it is, thinking, we do need to think of ourselves as a business because we're trying to do that, right? We're trying to be a thing, all right? So managing your time is probably the most important thing. I know a lot of us wanna let the muse come and see what happens, and that's great, <laughs> that's wonderful, but we do need to think of ourselves, you know, if we wanna just write to write, that's wonderful, but if we wanna write to make money, we need to start thinking about ourselves as a business, okay? So are we writing fast enough? Well, that could be your writing speed. Do I need to write faster? Do I need to write more efficiently? Like these are things, questions you need to make. Is marketing taking up all my time? And by marketing, I mean goofing around on social media, right? Could that cause a lot of marketing effort to burn you out? Like, oh, I'm spending all this time doing all my marketing efforts and I don't have enough time to write my next book or to finish the book that is sitting in my inbox. You know, it's been sitting there for months, right? Or someone like me where I went out to write another 
novella when I have three novels sitting there waiting to get out the door. And I said, I don't want to touch those because that's work. And I want to write the, <laughs> the next book, right? We're all guilty of it. So there's nobody special here. Um, and then finally, are, are you spending time to become a better writer? What's the big knock on self-published people? Well, they're not very good writers, right? Are we spending the time to improve ourselves as writers? Something that I've been doing for the last five or six years now is um, I, I collected a lot of books. I had a nice library. But I never read any of them. So I actually, like for the last five or six years, I've been moving through and actually reading the books that are on my shelves and say, okay, this is great. But I've been reading it from a writer's standpoint. How are they building scenes? How are they writing characters? How are they writing dialogue? You know, how can I you know, grok this and make this a better experience for me to be a better writer? How can I learn from them? Um, one way that I've improved that, even just talking about managing our time, you know, I used to be sitting there on my Kindle all day, kids yelling at me, and I'm just reading my you know, next book. And I said, well, I have a lot of lost time during the day, so I flipped over to doing audiobooks so that I can listen to those books during the day. So like little tweaks and, and changes that we can do to be more efficient with our time in order to meet our goals is, is the way to go. So does reading, writing, marketing, research cause you brain mush? Well, that is called focus. So how can we focus? Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, about 20% of the effort leads to about 80% of the results. And that's pretty true across the board. Um, 20% of the people tend to do 80% of the work in any organization. 20% of the effort around self-publishing will get you about 80% of the results, right? That is, we know those things. We've talked about them extensively. Some of the new people may not know that, but I'll have a slide coming up here. We'll talk a little bit about that, but like newsletters. Are you promoting your book? Do you have your book matter correct in your book? Are you editing your book? Is your cover good enough? Like these types of things that we know help to sell books. Are you doing these things? So question is, are you spending your time on the 20% of effort or are you spending your time on the 80% of effort that only nets 20% of the results? So we need to make sure that, again, that's part of that framework. Are we making the right decisions that push us down the field in the right manner? Okay. What one author can manage is not necessarily what you can. There's a lot of people out there. You know, I, I like to call it big author problems are not necessarily little author problems. Right, so something that like maybe Mark Dawson or some other big indie publishers running into isn't necessarily the problems that you're going to see. And that's why I always like to tell like people like us, look to someone who's like a middle level author or a low level author who's just a little bit above you because their problems are similar to your problems, right? They're making this, you know, similar scales of money or um, like, for example, with my wife and our, our podcast, when I'm not writing, um, we're looking to other podcasts that are ranked above us. And we're like, what are they doing? What does their logos look like? What, who are they interviewing? Things of that nature. Trying to, trying to vision what, what it takes to get to that next level, right? So this is the type of things you need to be thinking about. What can I put my time into to get the most results, all right? And we tend to institute infrastructure and systems so that they are manageable and thinkable. I know a lot of us who are garden writers in here and like to go with the flow, and how did, what, what tone is the rain chime making today? And does that mean I work on Facebook or do I write the, my blurb? You know, I, I'm not making fun. Or do you go pull weeds? <laughs> you know, when we have those, when we have a, a thinking and a focus in place, it can help us make the right decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? So we talked about, I've shown this slide in pretty much every one of my talks that I've given to the, here. This is everything we know, we kind of, this is the 20%, right? That will get us most of the, of the way there. Now there's always got to write a good book. You got to be a good writer. You got to be personable. You got to do the right things. You got also, the lightning has to strike perfectly twice <laughs> and everything. But we know from the standpoint of we're like, here's all the middle, you know, all these people who are successful, they're essentially doing these things, okay? And this is kind of the author digital ecosystem. I call it, the, we also call it the toolkit, whatever you want to call it. Here are the basic chunks, tranches of things you need to work on. And again, like I always say, each and every one of these bullets is a three to nine hour course, right? You can spend, you can go so deep into the weeds on every one of these things. But not every author who's successful is doing all, all of these things. things. Yes. Doing some of those things. Yes. And other authors are doing others of those things. Exactly. So, and we're going to talk about the, 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 the tightrope that we need to walk 
and finding what works for you, what works for your genre, what works for the type of books you're writing, and, and which one of these things you might need to need. So this is our digital ecosystem. This is the toolkit. I want, to, I want you to think about the tools. These are things that like the, the shovels, right? You're a gold digger. This is your shovel, right? You're, 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 trying to, you're trying to find gold and you get a good shovel, right? But then you step back and you say, well, what type of tactics do I need to approach? I don't just start digging in random spots, right? We need to go find good ground. That is a business model. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. What, which, one, which one do you want to know about? You want to write them all down? Uh, you know what? Listen, at, at the end, just um, send me an email, and I'll, and I'll just email these to you. Yeah, no worries about it. Uh, yeah, I'll just email it out to everyone. Yeah, no big deal. Yeah, <laughs> and I have a, I, we have talks on every single one of these items, so um, and they're on the YouTube channel as well. So yeah, so that's somebody who's got a tool. They're in there picking on the dirt, but they need to know where to, to mine. Where, where do I find that vein of gold? How do I find that? And that's kind of our business model. Are you a wide author, right? Are you exclusive to Amazon? And there are perks either way, right? Are you publishing other authors? Are you kind of the publisher, right? Are you licensing your rights? Small press, traditionally published. Are you doing your own contracts? You know, whatever that might be. Are you a creator business model? That's where you're doing subscriptions. You have a membership site. You're working off a of Patreon, whatever that might be. You're a Substack person. You are, you know, there's a whole host of ways to monetize your writing in a subscription model. So various business models, that's the tactics of applying your tools, right? So if I'm a wide author, I go back and I've got a newsletter. I do book promotions. I have a website. I do on social media. So you have a tactic, you have a business model, and then I start to apply the tools that are necessary to achieve that. But tactics are great. But you do, if you don't have a strategy to get you there, right, that governs all of those choices, you don't know what tactics you need to choose. Therefore, you don't know what tools you need to choose. A good strategy would be your publishing models. Are you a volume publisher? And we'll talk about what each one of these means. Are you an engagement publisher or are you a craft publisher? Based on your choice here, will help dictate what type of tactics you use, tactics being your models, and then ultimately what tools you end up using. Okay, so, so making that decision at the top end, and this doesn't mean a lot of us kind of implicitly know this, right? Linda, you probably have a good idea of like what type of writer you are. You're, you used to be a volume publisher, maybe not as much anymore, yeah. right? You were publishing a short story every month. I would, I most of us in this room would be considered that. <laughs> in fact, I would say anyone who publishes more than two or three books a year is a volume publisher. For most indie, when you consider the, the distribution of how many books indie writers are writing, anyone going over two or three, four books a year plus, that's a volume publisher. I mean, you're writing a book a quarter at that point. <clears throat> there are people who write a book a month. They're psychotic. But <laughs> well, the other thing too is, and we'll talk a little bit about the details, they got a team working for them, right? They're not just an individual. So they, they don't. They're writing, ten, they're writing five, 10,000 words a day. And, and good, you know, good for them. I, I, I wish them the best. Um, but the idea is that you want to have a good strategy. And that helps you inform what what tactics you use and what, what tools you use. Why? Because when we look at strategies, tactics, and tools, it is useless to go from right to left. Oh, everybody's on TikTok. I need to get on TikTok. How do I use TikTok? Well, what are you using TikTok for? What are you trying to accomplish with that? You have to then ask all these back-end questions instead of saying, what is my strategy? A plan designed to achieve a major and overall aim. Right? An example of that is I need to build community around my writing. This is a lot of corporate speak. And I know a lot of us in here don't want to think corporate -y, but this helps us guide us in the right direction. So a tactic, an action that is carefully planned to achieve a specific strategy. You may have multiple tactics that you're deploying to achieve a strategy. And it kind of funnels out like that. And then once you get to the end, you have all these technologies and tools you can apply. And a lot of them will overlap. You may have like 10 tools that you use and they apply to five tactics. And each tactic has, you can draw the nesting spider web 
how you're using them. Good example of this, build a community. Well, a great way to build community, I believe, as an author, and you can differ, you know, somebody could be a wide author, somebody could be a publishing on Substack or whatever, on Patreon, whatever. I have chosen that Amazon exclusive is the way to go for me. That's my tactic I want to do because I want to use their free days in order to get to tweak the algorithm to get my book up the up the you know the charts so that I can get it, I can get in front of new eyeballs. And the tools I'm going to use is I'm going to buy promos. I'm going to do free booksy. I'm going to do fussy librarian. I'm going to use my newsletter and I'm going to coordinate that on my free days so that I can drive my book into the top the front page of the free on my genre. So when somebody's out there, when the millions of people are going to Amazon every single day, and they're looking for new books and they click from paid to free, there's your book, right? And they, they click grab it and maybe it sits in their Kindle for a year. It's okay. Give away thousands of books. I've given away hundreds of thousands of books. It's okay. That's not the end of the world. You're going to get people to read it, and then they'll read the next book. Maybe they'll buy the next one, or maybe they'll sign up to your newsletter. Okay, that's the game you have to play. That's how it. If you go that route, okay. So you think about it. Build a community. My publishing model is engagement. We'll talk about what engagement publishers look like. I have chosen my business model, which is Amazon exclusive, and then I've used my author toolkit to engage that. So when you're thinking like this, when you're making decisions on what you hope to do. Your top level strategy could be make more sales. Okay, great, how am I gonna do that? And I go and look at all my various tactics and ways I can do that. Does it, any questions so far? I'm just trying to frame the discussion before we actually talk about the various publishing models. Not a problem. This one? Yeah, I was just going back and forth here. I didn't know how to tell the story No, it's okay. I was just going back and forth, and I, was, I, I, try, I, I agonized over these four slides for like at least a half an hour. I'm like, how am I going to talk about these today? The word, the words, the words word one way. Okay, so let's talk about publishing models. Publishing models inspire your book production, book production. Okay, the production of the book, not the writing, not the craft. It's the production, and the production is sort of like. The assembly line, how fast is it moving? How many hands are touching the production? So you could have Lay's potato chips, which they dump a pile of potatoes, nobody touches it, and at the end you have a bunch of bags of potato chips, okay? Or you could be in a leather shop in downtown Portland, and there's a guy who has a blacksmith in the back, and they're making the tools to make fix the boots, right? How much touch is there, right? That's the production. And then we have the marketing and promotion strategies. And those are kind of the two things that feed into what is a publishing model. So the first thing is you have to choose and think about what is right for you and what is right for your book. So if you are not a quick writer, I've been writing my memoir for five years, right? Okay, that's, that's a slower process. Some of us are genre writers. We might write a book or two a year. Linda, what, what's your cadence right now? Right now. Oh, okay, never mind. We won't talk about Susan, it. Susan, what's your, what's your cadence well, right now? Okay, it's back. I know you got a back. I your backlog right here. This guy needs to get off his butt. All right, I'm doing about one to two a year right now. I was doing about three or four a couple of years ago, and it wasn't right for me, so I had to make a change. Okay, so we have to make decisions that are right for you and your books that you're producing. But it's also it's okay to change and it's okay to tweak and move and, and adjust a little bit. You don't have to be locked into these type of decisions, and it's okay to constantly be asking yourself. You know, am I making the right decisions? Do I, am I putting in the right amount of time or am I doing the right things here or there? My wife and I were on vacation for a month in Ireland with our kids and we were driving to some castle and we got a long discussion about our podcast and like, what are we doing? How do we need to grow? What are the next steps? And we were talking about these various you know, things. We said, okay, what's the biggest problem that our listeners, you know, parents are, are, are running into and what can we do to build content that could support them, that could also help, you know, that we can monetize, right? And I know it kind of sounds dirty to talk like that, right? <laughs> a lot of us might feel it's very dirty to talk about it, but that is, that's, a, that's the way to think because we need to know, are we building the right things for the right people? 
So author X, we talked a little bit about this. Author X does Y activity, therefore I need to do Y in order to be X. The keeping up with the Joneses problem in the indie author community is, I think has ruined so many people. It is, while it is useful to see what, what is the new hot thing and to understand it, understand why they're doing it, doesn't mean you have to do every single new hot thing. You don't have to do that, and so many people have been burned out big time because of that. And I really would encourage you to not to resist that that need, that that desire to like stay to, stay with stay up with with the people who are being really successful. Um, most of, the, of us don't know what we've got to discover over this time. All models can help, and very often, our publishing models is kind of a blend. You're not choosing one or the other. You're blending these. You may be higher in one and lower in the other, maybe not existent in one of them, right? Or you could be equal in all of them. It's, it's really a blend of where you are. So let's talk about volume publishing because this is the one you will hear the most about. Um, <clears throat> you gotta get out there. You haven't published anything. You haven't published anything. You gotta get out there and you gotta publish 10 books this year, four books this year. Oh, congratulations, you published a book. Good, write the next book. You hear that all the time, right? Like, oh my God, man, I just finished. It took me years to get here. Any genre, this can help. This is an avenue for most people that you know can lead to any genre, but it really helps with nonfiction self-help. That's really good there. Because you tend to produce short things. You maybe blog a lot, maybe. And you can think about this not just writing books. You know, you're writing um, children's books, right? You could be producing a lot of children's books really fast. You could say, okay, I've made the commitment. I'm going to use the AI art generator, and I'm going to use Canva, and I'm going to really go whole hog and make 20 books this year, right? You would be a volume publisher, right, in your niche, okay? Um, this really leads well to romance because romance tend to be what we call them whale readers where, you know, not, no criticism of the people, but they come through and like a whale, and they just gobble up all the plankton, and that's, you know, they'll read it. 50 books, and my mom is a whale reader. She, what's the author's name? I.T. Lucas. Write that name down. I don't know who I.T. Lucas is. I do. You do? I do. How far, how far are you? My mom pre-orders the next book. She has read all 59 books. She's read them all, and she can tell you the whole thing. My mom does not watch any fantasy stuff. She's a big romance reader, but that is like straight up fantasy, right. gods and blah, blah, blah. My mom pre-orders those books. Yeah, and if she finds a series, and I've pointed her at a few authors in our group, and she just like gobbles up those books real fast. She will, like uh, Tori's books. It, she read them all in a weekend. It's incredible. I'm like, what are you? They're yeah, they're quick reads. They're they're easy reads, but it serves well in romance. Romance, you tend to see a lot of uh, whale reading, a lot of a lot of volume publishing. Also, anyone doing right to market. Um, when you hear that term, I'm writing to a genre and I'm hammering it. I'm a space marine, you know, sci-fi epics, and that's all I write, and I just hammer that. You'll see a lot of people writing a lot of books in that one genre. All right? This leads to series of novels. So, you know, novels that are in series, any type of serialization efforts. There are a lot of people out there who will write, say, 10,000-word episodic short, you know, like TV episodes, and then they will release one every week for a whole year. Right, that, that type of serialization, that's really just playing with the delivery of the content. Um, but you'll see that there. Um, this is a high production, high throughput. So they are writing a lot of words. Um, very often they have a team with them that are doing their editing, their covers, and their marketing. Um, I have seen this be done with individuals. And you can tell that they are a very, they're very focused. When they do it, they're writing in the morning, getting their 8,000 words, and they're editing in the, in the afternoon, and then they watch their true crime stuff in the evening. Like, I've, I've, I have heard, I've heard that story before. Um, so it can be done as an individual. You, you often see it with individuals with ghostwriters or individuals with other authors. So they kind of do a collaboration. So somebody is kind of brainstorming Patterson-like a story, somebody else is writing it. That tends to be the more mature version of a, of a volume publisher. When you're talking about the aggressive individual publisher, they are, those guys are, you know, Wolverines. They're amazing. Uh, I wish you could bottle it up and just spread it around with a little bit to us. But yeah, um, very often you do need a lot of advertising. So you're talking about Amazon ads, Facebook ads, BookBub ads, in order to drive the traffic and the volume to justify the high throughput and the high cost. So if you're talking about writing a 50,000 word sci-fi book and you shove it to an editor for three grand, 
to your, your book cover for 500, to your then, you know, copy editor for another couple hundred, you're, I mean, and then maybe your audiobook guy for another two grand, it's like 10 grand for a book, right? And they need to have a lot of income in order to support that, a lot of throughput. So they're pushing a lot. So good examples of this is Michael Anderley. He's famous for the 20 to 50K guys. So that's 20 books to $50,000 a year. Um, it's a great Facebook page. What's the other one, Wide for the Win? Yeah. These are really two really good Facebook groups to kind of just learn about, to watch, it's kind of like watch the fire from a distance. And uh, it's a good kind of like passive education um, on marketing and what people are doing. It's really good to, to watch. The other one was Sterling and Stone. They don't do as much as they used to, the Sean Platt and Johnny Trent. They were doing a lot of serialization like four or five years ago. They don't do as much of it now, but they still write, <clears throat> they write books really fast. And I think they've had a lot of like podcasts that I used to listen to, but they always like die and then they fire up a new podcast. It's always very strange. All right, that's volume publishing. What's the challenges with volume publishing? This is not good for all beginners. I did this at first because I wanted to build up a little bit of a catalog, so I wrote a lot. So I did NaNoWriMo perpetually. So I was doing 1,500 words a day. And when you do 1,500 words a day and you're writing short books, you produce a lot really fast. And I was doing the serialization, so I was doing like 35, 40,000 word serialized television episode type of things. And that really worked fine, but then my second kid came. <laughs> and that would just went right out the window. Um, it can lead to burnout. A, also, sh shockingly, um, when you're writing that much, you can, you know, the creative well does run dry because you're not spending any time thinking and you're spending all this time doing and you don't get any good ideas. I used to get a lot of good ideas from podcasts and watching stuff and, you know, you, something would happen. You'd, you'd get an inspiration of like, oh, that, I loved how that guy got killed. You know, in that manner. You, you mean on TV? On TV. <laughs> no, I, I haven't been on. I haven't been on those sections of the internet in a long time. Um, no, uh, bad jokes. Bad dad jokes. Um, I've had 30 straight days of bad dad jokes to try to get my kids away from me. That they just keep. It's like a magnet. Um, uh, yeah, like it's, like you would get something like something would happen that would get inspired and I'd go, oh, that's a really cool. I'd love to do some research about this type of, you know, fishing. Like someone got killed on a fishing boat. And I go, what if I did a story about a fishing boat that got swallowed by something, right? You start to think about things and you get some really good ideas. A lot of times when you're writing really fast, the creative well kind of dries, dries up. And so that's a big problem. Um, the fallacy of write the next book, we kind of talked about that. Um, I do like saying write the next book, um, especially to beginners, because you want to kind of build up the catalog. Um, it's hard to sell a book when you only got one thing. And it's hard to sell a book when you have like a lead magnet and one thing. It's nice to have like at least two or three things that you can try to shove a bunch of readers through, whether it's a series, whether it's standalone, whether they're standalone books in a common world, whatever you choose to do, um, it's good to have a little bit of a catalog. It doesn't mean you have to have 50 books or 20 books or 10 books, but having two or three is helpful. Um, it is an aggressive cadence, especially if you're doing books, short stories, graphic novels, web comics. A little bit easier, I think, on the short story side, if you want to do, say, I want to just power through and bring back the short story, that might be a little bit easier to do because you're writing shorter stuff. But short stories tend to be dense. It's like the, the smaller your writing gets, the less freedom you have with the words, and it becomes more meaningful when you choose which words. And then obviously driving that down to poetry where it's like you're needling on one word and the, you know, the cadence of a, these three or four words, you can spend a lot of time trying to make it right. So short stories can be both good and bad it's up to you. Um, also, how fast you are publishing weekly. I have seen the weekly people. I, I, I can't even imagine the pressure of producing something every week. You would have to have that banked. I, I could not imagine if you were doing that just in time delivery, where you're like, I'm writing the story this week that is going to be out next week. And then once I get that done, I'm writing the story for the next week. <clears throat> I would imagine you'd have to bank that up. Otherwise, you're just going to drive yourself nuts. Even monthly or bi-monthly, I mean, what was your experience of publishing a short story every month? Um, I was publishing every month, but I can easily write a short story a week. Yeah, I could. The problem comes when you are also editing your stories, yeah. copy editing your stories, formatting your stories, and doing covers for your stories, and doing all the marketing. And yeah. all of that sucks your time. Yeah, it does. I, I, I 
I've had more than one month where I wrote a novel a month. Yeah. And I can do that. It's not easy, but I can do it. But then I ran into the problem of the backlog of stuff yeah. that was waiting to get published because somebody had to do all the other work and that was me. Yeah. Yeah, when you're running solo, it's so hard. Yeah. yeah, that's why these tend to lead to having teams of people. Um, also, when you start doing volume publishing, and I know you were doing it with your newsletter, you know, people expect it, right? All of a sudden, now you have this culture of delivery that you're cultivating with your readers, and they're expecting that. And so there's a lot of struggle and, and, and frustration there if you, like, you miss a month or you miss a week or whatnot. You, you, you know, has she gone? Did she disappear? She flew down to Cabo. She's <laughs> given it all up. Who knows, right? Um, it also leads a lot heavily on the paid marketing, which can tend to be very scary when you're committing dollars. And it's not like you're committing, the numbers are not like I commit a thousand bucks and I make eight. It's more like I commit six and I make seven and a half, right? And the margin there is very narrow. And if for some reason something happens the next month and those sales are not seven and they're four, you've lost three, right? So there's, there's a danger there especially around paid paid marketing. So we want to make sure that we're, if we get into the paid traffic thing, it's within our budget that is sustainable. You know, all the gambling and betting problems, uh, you know, flow into that. Make sure you're spending what you can afford. Um, also, it features a lot of heavy digital data. So if you're not into like crunching data, like, oh, the click-through rate, and what's my cost per click? And all, if you don't like those type of terms or, 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 or worrying about the algorithm, this may not be the route to go. Okay. Also, a lot of people I've noticed with the volume publishing, they don't do as much of the social media stuff. They actually pay that. They outsource that. So they'll have somebody as their like social media coordinator, so they don't have to do it because, you know, a lot of us they get sucked into the social media. I'm not much of the Facebook guys, some of you guys, but I'm like get sucked into Reddit, or I'm reading the news or something. It's like I'm, I disappear or I listen to a podcast or something. If you get sucked in. Uh, you lose your your throughput. That affects your throughput. So a lot of a lot of them will just outsource that social media stuff. Okay. Engagement publishing. So this is bringing the reader into your process. To you, they are um, your oh, nice typo there. Your writing. Um, they bring them into your writing. The actual you know uh, who you are. You are the brand in some respect um, when you're doing engagement publishing. Um, some right to market stuff applies here because while right to market I think applies a lot to volume publishing or even just publishing in general, when you're doing engagement publishing, right to market may apply here because you are the creator. So there, there may be a little blend. So if you're thinking about the leveling there, you may do a little bit more engagement marketing. So key to understand here um, is understanding your reader and your follower. And I think a lot of us in this room fall into this category, is this type of, of, of way to build a community, our writing, our brand, who we are, this tends to be the most sustainable thing for us because we may not be writing as fast as, as the others and we can actually just spend that time to engage our readers and then when we do come out with something, we'll have a captivated you know, audience. It could be small, a couple hundred people, a couple thousand people, whatever it might be, to be interested in what we are. So understanding your reader or your follower, what do they like? What do they need? What services or offers appeal to them most? So that's more like the content creator side, but if you're writing or if you're writing poetry or you're doing a web comic or you're doing a podcast or a YouTube channel, whatever you end up doing, what do they like? What do they like the most? You may hear the term avatar. What is your avatar? Who is your reader? Well, I'm a romance writer, so my reader is a you know, woman between the ages of 35 and 60. She's likely married. She wants you know, a fun, quick read that has a good female protagonist, um, high romance, whatever it might be, right? So understanding your reader and who they are and what, what they appeal can help making, make you make good decisions on what you, what you choose to do. It does require a higher touch on your part, so there's more work on social media. You may need to do some custom things like, oh, Ah, uh, we're doing character interviews with my characters in my book this week. Or I write spy thrillers, so here's the dossier from my, my character. Um, you may have to produce other things in order to you know, intrigue people into, into your world, into your writing. Um, reader relations are key. Good example, this is Brandon Sanderson. Obviously, he's a big author with big problems, um, but he does a really good job on YouTube. Um, his Kickstarter was le is legendary. It's going to be legendary. I think his next one's even going to be bigger. When he, uh, 
I, I, this is my theory. So when it happens, you can, you know, I came here first. <laughs> I think he's going to Kickstarter the independent production of the television show for his series because he put out four books and he made $40 million from that. If he goes out and says, hey, I got a French production company that did this series, I need to raise $50 million, I could easily see that Kickstarter coming in at over 100. And if you give a certain amount of money, here's all the kick stuff, you know, kickbacks. That is a great example of like understanding his audience and what they want to see and what they want. Oh, did you not like the Wheel of Time, what they did to the Wheel of Time on Amazon? That's a shame. You should fund my Kickstarter. You don't like what they did to Lord of the Rings on Amazon? Don't let them do that with my stuff. Fund my Kickstarter, right? Whatever it might be. He also does really good social media, and he's really legendary about in-person events. Um, he really tries to get to, to talk to people, get to be in person. He's, he's a good example of what to follow. Um, he's very personable. All his fans love him. Um, you know, some say his books aren't like, he's not the best fantasy writer, but people like him a lot. So, yeah, Gaiman. Gaiman is a great example of that. Yeah, when he does his like, <clears throat> his, the, the mastermind that he did on, uh, what is it, mastermind, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it was amazing. I could listen to him for hours talk. His audio read of The Wolves in the Walls that you can get at the library is awesome. I let my kids listen he's a, to it. He's, a his, his, <clears throat> he's got a great voice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great, great. He's a very good writer, too. No, actually, I like the idea of Gaiman more than I like his books. <laughs> Every book I've read, I just kind of go, ah, at the end. It's always at the end. I'm just like, okay. Um, that was pretty good. Oh, I felt it. All right. So, what are the challenges with engagement publishers? Well, where do I start? That's always a big question. Where are my readers? That's like, oh, what do I do? You know, there's a lot of indecision there. Don't worry about it. Um, the time needed to find and cultivate readers can be frustrating, can be difficult. The grind, understanding that, oh, I wrote a book. Why am I not on Oprah? You know, it's like, you know. <laughs> A lot of times the expectations are, okay, I want to be a writer, and this is a 10-year thing, right? I'm going to commit to the long game. Like my wife and I had a, uh, when we started the podcast in the pandemic, um, I said, okay, three-year plan, right? So we set a date, and we will meet together, and we will discuss objectively whether we continue, right? Have we met our goals? Are we excited still about it? Are we making money? Is it justifying the time? All that type of stuff. Understanding that it is not a six month or eight month or nine month, it's a year's progression, right? And but showing up consistently, you know, just like you sit down every day and get your words in, you know, whenever we can, and we're constantly grinding, you gotta constantly be marketing as well, being out there and engaging. You don't have to be amazing, but you just gotta be there. That can be frustrating to people, um, can be exhausting. All right, so difficult to maintain focus. So because we have to go into the social media world, it can be distracting. There's a lot of dangers there, right? Also, because we are being more personable, there's the political minefield that we all have to navigate, right? Who's going to run into the, the wrong thing or this thing or that thing? Those are concerns that we all have, um, especially when you... I can tell you all from, from my standpoint, I have a decent-sized podcast now. It is terrifying. Uh, we live on edge of inviting the wrong person that we didn't know, they went on some other thing, and that thing talked to that thing, and that thing is bad. And, and because of that, like a heat-seeking asteroid, just kind of, and you start to feel the heat, and you're like, oh, good God, and it comes right by. <laughs> we live in utter fear. We know we do, we do. And it's, it's not one, way, one side or the other. We live in continuous fear of the asteroid coming down. We, we ran into it. But like good you know, ballet dancers, we let it slide right by us, and we avoided it. But we watched it come right at us, and it was dangerous and scary, and I'll never forget that those two or three days. Um, I, I do not empathize content creators who are large. I don't. Anyone getting dumped on, I don't care who you are, is the worst thing ever. I don't envy it, and I, I wish people would, would could be, sit in that position to understand the, the horror of you're building something and it all comes crashing down. Um, next thing, engaging without writing, editing, or, sh or shipping. Um, sometimes you have to put things out there that are short and fun and whatnot. A lot of times we don't spend the same amount of time that we do on our books, so you have to be okay with that. You know, I put out a newsletter, like for example, the newsletter that went out today, totally goofed up and I 
had the wrong paragraph section in there. And I saw it today and I said, I hope nobody realized this. <laughs> nobody realized it. <laughs> um, it can fill up your time fast. It's hard for introverts. So when you're engaging a lot um, and you don't like to engage, it can be tough. But there are alternatives because the anonymity of the internet can help you there, right? So, oh, my community is online, so I don't feel as much pressure. Um, going out and meeting people is scary. Um, I'm uncomfortable. It's hard to make eye contact, things of that nature. There are ways to alleviate that, but it is always a concern when we tell people, hey, you got to go out there and be personable, gosh darn it. Um, that can be scary, and that's a, an issue that people have to overcome. Um, and growing your team over time may become necessary, because especially with the, you know, if you do grow a certain size, it is hard to maintain it. I know my wife spends um, at least 10 or 15 minutes a day just like accepting new people on the Facebook group, making sure nobody has flamed out on the latest five or six posts, you know, and because I tell you what, man, we're back. We're back. Technical difficulties. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, sorry. <clears throat> There you go, growing your team. You may need a social media coordinator. Shift that off to the 18 year old who knows what they're doing. All right, craft publishing. Now, craft publishing is, is really cool and I think it works well with like say artists, poets, um, people who really wanna spend the time to build a unique experience. So these are unique books. These are the, you know, the experiences are in the book, in the content you're creating. Um, it can tend to take a long time to create that and they are very thoughtful. Um, obviously we want all our books to be beautiful and enjoyable, our covers to be nice, our internal matter needs to be beautiful, our chapter drop caps need to be perfect, of course. But there are some people who love to just like make it beautiful. I, I have devoted my life to make 10 copies of my book and they're bound in leather from, you know, I don't know, young calves or something, I don't know, whatever. There are some people who want to make the, the experience and the creative expression and the, and the creation of that thing, whatever it might be. This is more of you and the product. You are essentially creating the product, who you are, your mentality. I know in the podcast, um, the woman talks about um, the poet, uh, what's her name, Kaur, K-A-U-R. You see her book in like Target, Milk and Honey, I think it is. That one, you probably have all seen it. It's like 50% off or something. Um, she talks about that woman and, and what she does and, and, the, and the craft that she puts into like her developing her community on Facebook and Instagram and things of that nature. Reference that in the podcast. She tells a nice example of how she was able to do that. Um, definitely pushing small, vibrant niches. So if you are writing in a very narrow niche, like for example, um, Roland. what? Roland. Roland's a great example of that. Yeah, he writes in um, historical non fiction, fiction, biography, music. Like it's very, very niche, right? Mm -hmm. There is no niche too small. In fact, your niche should be at least three, three down. So like my podcast is uh, homeschooling. Um, it is uh, secular homeschooling. And then it goes down to early learners. So we focus on kids that are less than six, sixth grade, so under 12 years old. Um, that's our niche. So I, we niche down three. And you're, you should probably start when you write niching down about three levels. So I write contemporary fiction, female protagonist, set in the Midwest. And all my first three or four books should just be around that, right? So really exploiting your niche, whatever it might be. Um, obviously you have a passion for the project, publishing priorities, creative expression. So really just putting yourself into it. Um, great for the arts, great for content creators, great for um, artists, web comics, graphic novels, um, Instagram, art creators, whatever it might be. This is something where the craft is in is in the art, okay? Um, less about volume, more about quality, and very often they don't have a team unless they're really big, so. All right, challenges here. Obviously, you become more important to the product. You may need to share more of you. So some people don't want the world to know about them. Like, for example, we don't tell the names of our kids on our podcast. Uh, that's just a, a choice. You know, my kids didn't sign up for this, and so I don't want them to be part of it. There's a lot of people who make their kids the center of everything, um, which, okay, whatever, you know, but the, it is uncomfortable for me to, you know, to know that like there'll be strangers that know my kids, right? They don't know where I live or anything like that. Very often that in these craft creators, they, they can tend to be like, oh, she's the creator who lives on 
Market Street in Portland, right? And people know where you live, and that can be unsettling for some people, whatever that might be. Politics can get very risky here. So understand that opinions and stances. Say, gosh darn it, I only prefer this type of wine. And then obviously all the, you know, the Rioja fans come in here and start dumping on you. And the Malbec fans come in and say, you know, Pinots are not real red wine or, you know, whatever it is. And all of a sudden you get zero starred. And <laughs> this can be dangerous, right? It's very fraught. Um, they're, it's great for author artists. So if you're an artist as well as an author, this can help, help you as well because you're kind of blending that art with the creativity. I'm an artist as well. I make uh, AI art on mid-journey. So I have my French digital beret and I am an artist. My little words, I make art like that. <laughs> Love it. Um, I made my last five or six covers. That cover, the bread also rises, was made on AI art. Um, very difficult to say, to have a matador fighting a bowl made out of bread. The AI art was not, <laughs> was not, <laughs> Did not get it. I was. Not too bad. That would be I really, I really went deep on the uh, sun also rises uh, uh, prompts on the AI art, and it just did not work. So we went with the bread and the sunset. So anyway, so there's a. Oh, this is the big thing that I think we all should be aware of, um, and I don't think it's talked about a lot. Content creators will also talk uh, talk about this: is that you are at risk of audience capture. Okay, so for example, oh, I I've written you know horror, sci-fi horror. Uh, fantasy horror, um, and I'm about to release a uh, World War One zombie book. Classic. Why not, right? Why not? But all of a sudden, if I publish that, if I publish that and I sell 10,000 copies, guess what I'm writing more of? Yeah. So, I, I, <laughs> I have a, a World War II version of that that my wife said, <laughs> do not publish that ever. It's okay, somebody else published it, and he got zero starred. All the way down, so it was a good proof of proof that it wasn't going to work. Yeah, but you could do it better. I could damn well do it better. You know, I could. <laughs> All right. Um, so risk of audience capture is a big problem. So you know, directing what you're writing because if you're a craft person, it's you know, it's something that's in here, and you're letting people experience what's in here. Um, if all of a sudden you get success, they're pulling your creative art in this direction. So be aware of that. This is a risk when you're doing craft publishing and just publishing in general. Um, that the audience can often and the success can dictate what you continue to do as opposed to what you maybe want to do. All right. Um, yeah, money, money tends to not be the focus here. A lot of people just do this because they love it. Um, any questions regarding all of that? This is a summary, kind of where you are. It's very often a blend of, of all these things. Go ahead. Would you say that engaged publishing and craft, they're very compatible? Like yeah, I think so quite similar, so how are they different? So engagement, I, it, it's hard because engagement, you can see it working well with like a volume publisher and a craft publisher. They're t they tend to be doing the same. Um, craft, I think, is more, um, it's more, it's a very, I would almost imagine it'd be a lot less volume. So you're talking about, if you're looking at a volume spectrum of what you're producing, you're, you're very low on the craft side, right? Engagement, I think, would, would apply more to what we are all doing, like maybe a book a year with a couple short stories. Um, but the difference would probably be is, is the amount of effort you put into the book or into whatever your, whatever your maybe I'll, I'll say it a better way. It's how you view it, right? I think if you're an engagement publisher, I'm writing books that I hope people will enjoy, right? Um, I am trying to figure out, you know, what, what genre would be good, where my books could, and so I'm thinking about the reader. When I talked about like, what do you know your avatar so you can write the book to the avatar. In some respects, a craft writer doesn't care the person out here. It's more about I'm producing the thing that is important to me. So it tends to be, I, almost in some, in some respects, it's a focus. It's like, who are you focusing on? I think a craft person is, is looking in a mirror and an engagement person is looking at a reader. If, if I could boil it down to something simple like that. Another question? No? Okay. Well, okay. Well, there, there it is. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to um, answer afterward. If you don't want to ask in front of everyone, I'll go ahead and stop this. How did I do, Joel? How long was that? <laughs>